Thursday tat, uh, chat, Tim. And welcome everybody and also happy first day of spring. I'm gonna take the opportunity to sum up some ideas for a project many of you have heard me proselytizing about for a long time now, memoir writing. It began with the thought, perhaps a significant insight that senior anthropologists embody a lot of history. Or more precisely, we can present ourselves to each other and younger colleagues as the living history of anthropology. Members of the Association of Senior Anthropologists already have been doing this through panels uh, at AAA meetings and in some of their publications. I couldn't find a picture to show that it's never too late to do memoir writing. But maybe the opposite is true for our younger colleagues, that it's never too early. Can we find a way to make memoir writing more explicitly an ongoing activity as a distinctive, if not unique, contribution of the Association of Senior Anthropologists? That's the crux of today's presentation. An alternative title might be Memoir Writing as a Distinctive Project of the Association of Senior Anthropologists. Over the past several years, some of us have been discussing ideas about memoir writing in abbreviated form, sometimes in annual meeting papers and panel presentations, at other times in brief articles. I'm grateful for the opportunity today to develop these proposals more fully and coherently. The initiative can be understood as an exploration of legacies worth sharing. Legacies may be a late career concern for many of us, especially if we haven't been reflecting on our career choices from the outset. A few disclaimers. These are exploratory ideas still in their impl implementation at an early stage, somewhat scattered in the presentation and showing points on the screen that can't be developed at any length. I'll stop in time for you to raise questions of clarification, express doubts or objections, and I'm hoping offer examples from your own lives and perhaps writings. I'll begin with some exemplary memoirs, point one, as a background of what's possible and what's already been attempted. Then I'll try to explain, too, as concisely and coherently as possible how earlier stages of our lives can be approached is what might be called autoethnohistory. Then three, I'll list past efforts of the Association of Senior Anthropologists. We're definitely not starting from scratch. You can the next, see. what's that? Was there a question? Okay, the next point four can be a key element in memoir writing by senior anthropologists the degree of belonging in which we participate in any group and how the immersion and engagement change over time. This is a decisive component of any sustained social interaction, whether we're functioning as anthropological researchers or living our everyday lives. Unfortunately, there won't be enough time today to go very far into the nuances and the implications of this. It was the topic of a two-part session at last year's AAA meeting and I'll expand on that a bit. Lastly, five, I'll distinguish different stages of the life cycle and within them stages of anthropological careers that could be separate memoir essays or separate chapters in a memoir or topics of standalone or even multi-volume memoirs. For me, the very act of sketching out a memoir fragment led to something completely unexpected colored pencil drawings as a technique for eliciting memories and communicating them visually. I'll share some of that. So here goes. Please take a moment to look over the list of names. All have written memoirs I've come across, some in years past, but most as I became serious about an ASA memoir writing project. What struck me not only how scratching the surface exposes more and more of such writing, but also how different in form and content, scope and focus, tone and purpose memoirs can be. You might be wondering about names left off. 
or why, for instance, the non-anthropologist George Stocking is included. But as an orientation, I will say more only about Mary Catherine Bateson, Kieran Narayan, Howard Campbell, Peter Worsley, and Glenn Peterson. I can imagine more senior anthropologists wanting to use the memoir form of writing to reconsider their careers. In my own fragments, I'm emphasizing early stages for fuller ethno-historical treatment. Belonging at the family level can influence our approach to anthropology beginning early on, but also throughout a lifetime, including later in career too. I can't think of anyone more strongly influenced by becoming in becoming an anthropologist than Mary Catherine Bateson with Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson as parents. There's always more to say about Margaret Mead, of course, and she wrote a memoir about her own coming of age. Kieran Narayan had a fateful background shaping her identity as an anthropologist. As many of you know, her father was a South Asian Indian and her mother came from a German American family in the US. She grew up in a beach suburb of Mumbai, still called Bombay in her memoir, influenced by the new age spirituality of her mother and the hippie seekers passing through. She eventually carried out research through her father's family on more traditional Indian spirituality. Her classic article with the title, How Native is a Native Anthropologist, deals with the complexities of insiders having to distance themselves in ethnographic careers as counterparts to outsiders having to some degree become insiders to gain entry. Howard Campbell married a local woman while doing dissertation fieldwork in Oaxaca, and they adopted her niece, who was born prematurely and needed medical attention. This is how he became part of a family in his research community. He engaged in radical partisan politics and an associated arts movement. After being divorced, however, he felt he couldn't return for many years. Peter Worsley and Glenn Peterson both got out into the world at a young age through military service, which influenced their approaches to anthropology. Worsley was a towering figure in the social sciences, not only anthropology. His autobiography sweeps through his Liverpool childhood and elite English education and lifetime of work and travel all over the world. His formative experiences include service as a British colonial officer leading African troops in India and participation in communist youth groups in the immediate post-World War II period. The latter connections blocked his official clearance for African research, and he had to go to Australia for his doctorate. But he produced groundbreaking accounts of third world development and related ethnographic manifestations, such as the Melanesian cargo cults, he also participated in the group trying to establish peace studies and anthropology. Glenn Peterson writes about his anthropology career as atonement for his participation in the Vietnam War. He ran away from home without completing high school and enlisted in the Navy for training to advance his employment opportunities in electronics. Sent to the Gulf of Tonkin as a radar operator on surveillance flights off an aircraft carrier, he focused on excelling in his observational and equipment maintenance duties and his responsibility for keeping himself and the other crew members alive. I met him as we both were beginning graduate studies in the Columbia Anthropology Department, but knew nothing about his life and career until reading this memoir published in 2022 <laughs> in New York, he immediately became a militant anti-war activist and drank heavily, which helped him suppress his flashbacks of trauma and feelings of guilt. His research on political memoir writing as a project, wait a second. I did something wrong with my pages here as so often happens.
Dang, excuse me a moment while I rescue my sage five. I'm messed up here. There it is. Okay. His research on the uh, political anthropology of Pompeii, part of the U.S. governed trust territory of Micronesia, contributed to its drawn out complicated process of gaining independence. As he settled into a long and satisfying career at Baruch College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, he also was honored to serve as a member of the Pompeii delegation to the United Nations. Now to indicate more precisely what memoir writing but senior anthropologists could entail. Everything I say is open to expansion, refinement, and negotiation of concepts and procedures. Many of the terms are up for grabs and they appear in italics. Please get your comments ready for the discussion that follows. You may wanna put them in the chat column as we go along. I do want to offer a simple, if not simplistic working definition of a memoir as a thematic as distinct from comprehensive uh, autobiography. Childhood is often pivotal in steering us toward anthropology in the first place and influencing what kind of anthropologists we become, even if we didn't hear the word or learn of the discipline until say, stumbling into a college elective course. Then memoir writing could cover experiences at any or all stages of life, including in many cases undergraduate studies, but especially during specialized graduate training and as the multiple activities of research, teaching and political engagement play out. While I'm overwhelmed by the monograph length anthropological memoirs I've encountered so far, Attempting one for my own life and career feels just too daunting. That's why my approach is to compile many more fragments in a gradual process of filling in some, if not all of the blanks. Crucially, what can distinguish an anthropological memoir is its ethnographic sensibility. What I mean by this is our professional capacity for emphasizing our social memories shared with family, friends, colleagues, and other associates rather than dwelling on the idiosyncratic personal memories. Finally, when we mobilize our ethnographic interests and skills to explore our own past lives, we engage in a kind of an ethno history. It bemuses me to ponder the ethics of browbeating the little kid I once was for detailed descriptions about everything that was happening to him at different places and times throughout the early stages of his life cycle. I also try to recall what he saw others do and heard them say. I complement these thought experiments with searches for old photographs and other forms of documentation. In this way, I've tentatively chosen the term auto-ethnohistory, a combination of autobiography and ethnohistory to epitomize memoirs that elicit the localized settings, activities, and institutions highlighted by our subjective experiences. There definitely are precedents for the activity I'm urging ASE members to make more explicit. Several years ago, Jack Kelso sent an invitation to all ASA members to contribute chapters to a book with advice to beginning anthropology students. From those who responded, some of the accounts describe highly relevant coming of age and formal training experiences. And I know some of the contributions offered were, were rejected. Many of you may own or be aware of the book with revised presentations from several years of ASA sessions at the annual meeting. Alice Kehoe and Paul Doughty organized the sessions and edited the book, with some of the participants reviewing their careers as innovative anthropologists during the decades immediately following the Second World War. Maria Luisa Achino Loeb and Louise Lamphere edited a special issue of the Journal of Anthropological Research containing revised and expanded versions of papers from an ASA panel at the 2019 AAA meeting. The articles cover things left out from earlier fieldwork accounts, whether unintentionally because of other priorities, 
or intentionally for discretionary reasons. Relevant to memoirs, they deal retrospectively with the personal circumstances and choices of the ethnographer in ways not appropriate for prior publications. The ASA still has a fairly complete set of papers from recent meetings that await treatment for thematic collections of memoir writing. And finally, the paper session and mentoring panel at last year's AAA meeting in Toronto were formulated explicitly as part of a proposal. And this is where my pages were kind of out of order, so I'll find my way again. Oops. I'm lost. I'm so sorry. I had these pages. Five, six, eight, seven, and eight. Okay. Um, so this was as memoir writing as a as a project that can help define a distinctive scholarly role for the ASA. And the next slide gives some shout outs to the participants. The full title of the two part session is Between Professional Stranger and Auto Ethnographer, Degrees of Belonging in Anthropological Research. The paper presenters were Murdine Anderson, Rena Letterman, Francine Silant, Phyllis Passariello, Jack Glazier, Moshe Shokade, Yoko Tsuji, and me. The discussants were Virginia Dominguez and Susan Trencher. Bill Mitchell, the chair, added his comments too. The workshop had the title, Compiling Fragments of a Memoir. The panelists were Maria Cattell, Maria Vesperi, Paul Stoller, Marion Berghahn, and me. I'll mention that we were scheduled at an early Saturday morning slot and the attendance was low. But the discussion raised many relevant issues to build on, including the importance of clear and vivid writing. Let's dwell on reflexivity for a while. This is a partial outline of my introductory paper for the Toronto session. There was some resistance to my attributing Michael Agar the status of professional stranger, the title of his much heralded book, he meant this at least somewhat ironically, and he did engage in more personally in a more personal way with individuals in his later field work. And I was taking the professional stranger as a Weberian ideal type, partly as a foil for stereotyping many of our forebears in the name of decolonizing anthropology. The opposite ideal type is the autoethnographer, those who in the strictest sense study their own immediate group. Autoethnography is another fuzzy term, which can mean more loosely carrying out research anywhere in one's own country. The crux of the matter is recognizing the positionality and subjectivity that memoirs can elaborate, whether as outsiders who have to integrate themselves or insiders who have to distance themselves to carry out ethnographic fieldwork. The latter must guard against taking too much for granted while recognizing their likely idiosyncratic perspective on their own culture or subculture. Here I'll turn to my presentation in the introductory slot for the Toronto AAA session on degrees of belonging to add a few striking examples of memoir writers to those already mentioned. As one influential example of possibilities for engagement, June Nash has written extensively about her relationships in several contrasting research settings. Beginning fieldwork in Chiapas Maya communities, she first had to demonstrate that she was a true human, gradually gaining acceptance by bringing her children with her into the field and developing contacts by purchasing artisan goods and bringing in other customers. Her extraordinary rapport with militant Bolivian tin miners laid the groundwork for advocacy of their cause as laborers and members of oppressed indigenous groups. 
she became an exception to the taboo prohibiting women from entering the underground work sites. This allowed her to document organizational and symbolic resistance practices inside the mines, as well as through community activism. She helped friends compile and publish autobiographical accounts of their lives that further humanized their struggles under oppressive conditions. Upon returning to the US, she produced innovative ethnographic accounts of communities of workers displaced by a major General Electric plant closing in Pittsfield, near where she spent her summers in her home state of Massachusetts. Much more about relationships of belonging in Nash's career could be spelled out, including within anthropology, fighting for the inclusion of women and Latin American colleagues, and encouraging the efforts of early career neophytes such as me. For June, an existential quality of belonging reinforced by face-to-face -face interactions and mutual support at the local level over time was essential to her larger project of promoting international working class solidarity. In some cases, anthropologists have established a niche in fieldwork communities or other institutional settings by filling a more or less formal role. Paul Stoller attained insider status by becoming a student of a healer, a spirit medium in Niger. After many return visits, he was gratified to be told by his mentor that he had learned a great deal, quote, but today I want you to open your ears and understand what's important. Every day our people do things that anger the bush. Every day I make offerings to the bush to set things right. That is my work. That's what I want to teach you. I hope that my work can become your work. Taking no, end quote, taking note of the wildfires and floods that have devastated much of the rest of the world, Stoller acknowledged the wisdom of his Songhai teacher, asking, quote, is it not time to extrapolate from the wisdom of people like Adamu Genitongo and admit that human beings who live in the village have never been masters of the bush, end quote. For him, it is these personal relationships that slowly help us develop insights to share in, um, quote, sensuously described ethnographic narratives, end quote. Along with his insights about belonging, Stoller tries to show us how to communicate effectively. For his prolific writing, it is only a slight exaggeration to say that memoirs can be read as ethnographies and as ethnographies can be read as memoirs. So I stapled some pages that were out of order and I have to find them again. I'm afraid I don't have them and we're going to have to move on. Um, I talked about um, Lynn Bolas, who as um, an African-American woman from the U.S. worked in Jamaica and uh, she was treated very much with su was suspicious by the Jamaican factory workers and gradually um, gained some rapport with them um, by representing them in their labor negotiations and so forth. But it goes to show that even if you share an identity as um, an African-American woman with people in the field, there can be these barriers that have to be overcome. Um, um, have some of you heard of Mafela Ramfeli, who was a, a prominent uh, figure, was a prominent figure in the South African government. She began as a community organizer, uh, eventually um, earned an MD, and picked up an anthropology doctorate because she felt she needed that because she needed the ethnographic uh, perspective, even though she was horrified by some of the attitudes in the way um, uh, anthropology was taught in colonial South Africa. Uh, Esther Newton became well known um, for her um, groundbreaking um, ethnography of Mother Camp about uh, bisexuality and female impersonators, but only later in life acknowledged uh, 
um, her own um, lesbian identity. And then uh, she wrote a memoir, you know, Margaret Mead Made Me Queer. Um, then there's Robert Murphy, who um, lived his whole life taking for granted uh, his mobility, his ability to do whatever he wanted. Um, and um, when he was um, in his 50s, he developed a tumor on his spine that turned him into a, a paraplegic, a quadriplegic. And um, he then wrote a memoir of what it was like to be a quadriplegic, but also identified um, that was a whole subculture that he had no sense of until he could do it as a kind of an autoethnography. The best of both worlds is represented um, by Barbara Meyerhoff, who did a classic study of the Weichel um, peyote hunt, um, and then came back and wanted to do a study at home in, uh, in Los Angeles among uh, when she was working and had a grant to work with seniors. And, and she approached, she approached um, uh, the Chicano community who told her, you know, why study us? Why don't you study your own kind? And then she did her second major field work among seniors in, um, in, in, a, in a senior center in Venice, California, and, um, and led to the renowned uh, video that won an Academy Award for Best doc Documentary and her ethnography um, with the title, both of them, Number Our Days. Um, she then um, um, had another documentary video done ethnographically when she um, developed terminal cancer and um, investigated her Jewishness and her Jewish identity as she was um, entering the final stages of her life. Uh, so talk about, you know, going through the whole life cycle and doing that kind of autoethnography at the end. Uh, Ruth Bear um, left Cuba at a very early age and did some standard ethnography in Spain to um, get her doctorate. But she was um, fascinated uh, obsessed with her own heritage um, um, as, as a Jewish Cuban American, and then went back to Cuba and did more work in the Caribbean. Her research was always very personal, where she did biographical studies. So, so her ethnographies were very much on the personal level, and she did that with herself. So she's another anthropologist who, um, who does autoethnography, but at the same time memoirs, or memoirs that are at the same time autoethnographies. Um, I only want to add um, um, to those kinds of outsiders looking in and insiders looking out and integrating that the kind of very personal um, approach to ethnography I feel is insufficient as much as it's important and we have to know something about the ethnographer's own life before we can understand, you know, what they're studying and what they're, uh, how they're studying it and what they're missing, that I also feel it's um, not a, uh, a substitute for still having um, anthropology doing social science and behavioral science research and also being rooted in the biological sciences. In other words, I'm, I'm trying to um, talk about the best, best of both worlds when I pursue memoirs, not switch over to only doing the humist, humanistic kinds of studies. And then um, uh, we've returned again and again in recent years to Zora Neale Hurston, who um, faced the dilemma of being sent, um, you know, back in the twenties when she um, she was um, at Columbia and recruited in the Boazian circle to go back home to Florida and do um, folklore studies, um, where she came back with her. Um, her Manhattanite manners that she'd learned and a Chevrolet and um, had to then um, get back to the level of the people she grew up with to establish the rapport to do that kind of field work. Um, and eventually she did field work in other places in the Caribbean too. But, you know, she was a person onto her own. And the very important thing to remember about her is that um, she was from the beginning an outsider in anthropology and she never really was accepted as an insider 
And eventually she returned to her to her writing, which was more creative writing. And um, the point I want to make here is that um, she wrote novels um, that been that can be uh, seen also as um, uh, as ethnographic memoirs. So I did that without my notes. So these are um, some of the stages that um, memoirs can deal with. And that's one of the reasons why I find it so overwhelming to think of writing a complete autobiographical memoir um, with the focus on what it was that um, influenced us to um, turn to anthropology in the first place and what kind of anthropologists we became. We can think of um, early childhood, uh, I see that, you know, as very, very difficult because it's hard to recreate the world as we saw it as a child. And um, the additional problem, this was something I believe Jose Luis Borges learned from his father and took to heart, is that you really can only have a memory once. Uh, so going way back and trying to remember something or remembering something at an early age, when you remember it again, it's the memory of the memory. And then it's the memory of the memory of the memory. So it's really not um, direct access to the original. And that makes it a kind of a hall, hall of mirrors. It is, you know, you have to be very careful um, to try to figure out actually went on. Uh, then there's the issue of when you come of age and you're a child, you have direct sensory impressions, but you don't um, have the you don't jump to the meanings and the purposes. They're pure experiences. And that's um, an enchantment of childhood. As we um, go out into the world and have these um, uh, experiences and impressions, we become more purposeful. We want things to happen. And things may not always work out well for us. We're not all nurtured as children. So we get bad memories too. And so what I'm saying is there are many ways in which Growing up is a kind of a disenchantment, um, but I'm saying that it's possible and it's not possible for all of us if we're fortunate that we have enough freedom that we can weigh out our good experiences and our bad experiences, you know, work them up, write them up, and then approach um, them with a sense of re-enchantment, things that are, um, that are so stunning and, and pure that we can, um, relate them in a very direct way. It's like going back to the past and doing an ethnography of various experiences, doing them through vignettes. Um, I'm not gonna um, give any examples from um, youth and college, but there's the question of whether it's a good investment or wasted on the young. And, and that's really something that our generation, not everyone, many of us, probably most of us, had the freedom to go to college to find our way. For me, that was a turnaround. It was um, something when I was growing up, uh, uh, I didn't think about my heritage. And once I got to college, I really started digging deeply into that. And I was able to explore the social sciences and all of those things that still did not make me an anthropologist. But um, it was that kind of a luxury to, um, to make me finally realize that I could um, go to anthropology. So youth and college uh, uh, are times in which we make decisions about our lives. And I think for those of us who are anthropologists, there are all kinds of things to write up and share. In our professional training, we go through a kind of an hourglass or a funnel. We really narrow down and specialize. Um, again, those of us who've had freedom to pursue our interests um, can expand again from the very narrow specialized interests that it took to do dissertation research and write a dissertation. Others of us, I think, um, become much more specialized and stay with the kinds of narrower outlook. It's like going through a funnel. And I'm saying that that can be a subject for a memoir too, when we go very deeply into a field, but some of us can also use the memoirs to show how we expanded again after we had our initial professional training. 
I consider midlife and mid-career a maelstrom. As I reflect on it, we were always too busy, torn with too many things to do. Uh, careers and families and some kind of you know public persona that there was hardly time to, to reflect on it. Um, and you know, we were dominated by a struggle for security, for having some kind of an impact. And whether we were able to say, does this mean anything, might've been put on hold. But these are things we can go back and, and rework um, through memoir writing too. And now we get to our uh, post careers, although some of us are still very active. It can mean withdrawal, you know, finally a chance to relax. Um, maybe then in relaxing, doing some reflection. But, um, you know, maybe we can do new initiatives like some of us who've, not me, but some of us who've founded, you know, um, nonprofits in the areas where we did our field work and are very active in them, uh, especially once we're retired um, or do all of the above. So uh, this is um, how I uh, went about um, with my partner, Donna, who um, started about a year ago, um, a kind of a meetup for people to do arts and crafts at the local branch of the public library every Thursday afternoon. And I'm missing it today. Um, I went along kind of as moral support and she gave me some colored pencils and some paper. And I was doodling for several months and then trying to draw a few things and remembering how painful art was because I could, never could get it right. I tried to draw what was out there and never could get it right. But then it occurred to me that I would try to draw some of these scenes from my childhood as kind of an inspiration and maybe a possible way to communicate. And then it didn't matter. I didn't have to get it right. It was basically, you know, drawing what I remembered. And a profound early experience was riding with my mother on the bus from our apartment, which was in the Windsor Hills area uh, of Los Angeles, kind of near the airport, across town to the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Vine Street, where my pediatrician had her office. Um, it's that building there on the right. Um, I remembered that it had this beautiful sign that was an advertisement for Miller High Life beer. When I, when I checked back in a photograph, it is a beautiful gigantic sign, um, but it was on top of the building, not on the side of the building. Over on the upper right, I, I drew in the Griffith Park Observatory, a magical place for me, but I don't think you can see it from here. And I don't even know if you could see into the hills from the bus, the Hollywood sign, but at that time it was still a sign of a, of a housing development and they called it Hollywoodland. And so later they took down the last four letters. Um, I was fascinated by the street lamps. And so I drew them in on the left. And so these are the kinds of things that um, were important to me as a little kid. I just loved that. It was almost worth the risk of having to have a shot when I went into, you know, for my appointment at the doctor's office. Dr. Schiff was like my parents, um, a German Jewish refugee. She took care of all of the, uh, the Central European immigrants' children. Some were refugees, some had come earlier, some were in show business, some were um, the intellectuals. Um, one of the children she took care of was Bertolt Brecht's daughter. So this is my way of showing that I grew up in a kind of a, a subculture uh, of, of German Jewish immigrants, most closely around um, the relatives, a few of the relatives who escaped. Also some people who were in that circle who were friends but not relatives. Also people we didn't know who came together. <clears throat> it also included Germans who weren't Jewish. It also included other Central Europeans. Um, but I distanced myself from that subculture because I wanted to be like the other kids. Uh, and my parents didn't give me those cues. And once I started playing with other kids in the neighborhood, uh, uh, I didn't want to hear German anymore. Uh, I was kind of embarrassed. I think I'm exaggerating. But when I opened my lunch uh, and brought out my sandwich and looked at all the other kids with their white bread sandwiches with uh, bologna and, and yellow mustard or peanut butter and jelly, and then mine on rye bread, with uh, fancy German cold cuts and brown mustard. I didn't want to eat it. I didn't want to be different. So these are the kind of you know little things that you can bring out in a, in a memoir that help um, 
show a lot of things. And for me, that whole childhood was growing up with the cognitive dissonance of being between these two subcultures, uh, the one of my parents and the one of this burgeoning uh, suburban youth subculture that, you know, eventually became a pretty rebellious generation. Um, not something that I really um, considered at the time. Um, among my formative experiences were all of the names that were in Spanish, all of the other Latin American influences that puzzled me, but attracted me. And um, you may have seen uh, um, last fall, I, I had uh, an article in Anthropology News about the La Brea tar pits and my cognitive dissonance because the La Brea tar pits means the tar tar pits. I was so offended when I was learning Spanish finally in junior high school that Brea means tar and nobody else knew that that was a redundancy. And then I was also upset that um, after five semesters of Spanish, I still couldn't speak Spanish. I mean, I had, uh, you know, playmates, a Mexican playmate across the street who spoke uh, uh, Spanish with his abuelita and, and all of those things that fascinated me. Then in the third grade, we had this uh, Inca pageant in which we drew uh, uh, the Inca wall uh, on butcher paper and, and stitched iconography into tunics that may or may not have been you know, authentic um, and then had a pageant. And as some of you know, I tried very hard to get permission from Walt Disney Enterprises to show a page from a book that I got from the library, Donald Duck Sees South America, which really um, also whetted my desire to go someday to the Andes. And so um, I got my revenge by drawing it into this picture in which I'm looking at this book with uh, the, the drawing facing the first page of text of Donald Duck in a travel agent's office pointing to a map or the agents pointing to a map and the agents asking Donald Duck, where do you wanna go in South America? And he said, everywhere. And so those were influences that, you know, eventually um, showed up in my wanting to, um, to become a Latin Americanist anthropologist that went on through their others, but one was in high school when um, after a good track workout, when I um, went out to the front of the school to wait for the late bus, there was this um, old man with a push cart selling tamales. They were so delicious and it was such a treat. And so there's no small role that um, getting hooked on Mexican food um, at an early age also uh, was that kind of an influence. So I'm sure the rest of you have those kinds of things too. Um, you can see all these different stages of life. And I just would want to ask, you know, the rest of you, you know, whether you've, you know, if you've not done this already, um, whether it's a fragment of a memoir, or you want to write the whole darn thing, what would you write? Um, and then if you mind, want to use the same technique as I did, what could you draw? Okay, how do we do with time? Are we at 40 minutes, 45 minutes, Tim? Tim? Oh, he's muted. We, yeah, we are uh, at about uh, 45 minutes. Okay, that means I should finish within five minutes, I guess. Or should I stop now? More, more or less, uh, you know, but stop when you when you think you you should stop. Well, this could be a, a whole story. This is a tale. This is a vignette. But after my first semester of graduate school, um, I had the opportunity to drive someone's car to somebody else from um, the East Coast to the West Coast and stop off on the way at a ex-Peace Corps friend in El Paso, Texas. I wanted to visit and, or at least call somebody in El Paso. This was my professor at Hawaii when I was becoming disillusioned with public health as I was getting my master of public health disease. And I took his introductory course for graduate students in sociocultural anthropology. Um, I took that course and um, it kind of was the tipping point where I, I left after my year as an associate director in the counterculture of the Waikiki Drug Clinic and went to New York to Columbia to study anthropology. Um, so I wanted to uh, tell him after my first semester that he'd been influential, you know, and, um, and that um, now I was on, I thought, my career path. But 
as happens on trips cross country, you get delayed and they didn't have time to call him. My parents, when we got to Los Angeles for our visit, took my wife Connie and me to Death Valley and led us off on a place where you can walk across on a path um, in Zabriskie Point, you know, a spectacular kind of spooky landscape, with yellow rocks and all of that. And even though it was December, it was hot. <laughs> And there was that shimmering, you know, which which makes the the road in front of you look like a lake, and um, and reflect the sky. And as we were walking, th there was some kind of figure that took shape in that shimmering. So that's what I'm trying to show in this drawing. And so we walked closer, and out of that shimmering mirage came this very same professor, David Ide. Now, you got to remember that I was coming out of the counterculture and we were into all kinds of mystical stuff. So, you know, I, this was far out, man, um, to somebody who I'd wanted to see, thought about, hadn't called. And here he shows up at this, you know, magical spot. But if it didn't do anything else, and I had my doubts when, um, when graduate school was hard and not everybody was nice and I was on the verge of some disenchantment with what I had decided to do, which, you know, was go for my degree at Columbia. Um, this certainly was a re-enchantment and, and whether or not it was a mystical experience, it reaffirmed my dedication to become an anthropologist. So I'll leave it with that. I'll leave this screen up for a moment with, you know, summarizing all these points, but I'm ready to open it up now for your own comments that you wanna share anything or raise any questions, wide open. Uh, okay, so, um, or maybe there's something in the chat that you want to um, pick up on, Tim. Uh, no, there's nothing in the chat yet. Okay. All right. So, uh, just your, uh, do, do I, I think it would be helpful if you would just for a second, uh, with the summary that you have here, uh, tell us, um, how, how would you like to see our Q and A go? Well, this is a recapitulation of uh, the approach I'm um, um, suggesting that we take to explore our encounters and relationships past and present in, in an, with an ethnographic sensibility. And then this idea of uh, where we are moving back and forth between professional stranger and autoethnographer, that how do we efface the outsider-insider dichotomy discover or develop degrees of belonging, but also, you know, as anthropologists, because many of us have felt like we're outsiders in anthropology. And um, it's possible to do, you know, ethnography of the anthropological community. And I think many people have done that. I think that's why I included George Stocking's memoir, that I consider him an ethnographer of anthropology. Um, this question of ref reflexivity that um, came in before the postmodern turn. And uh, my own view was to, to welcome the postmodern turn with at most two cheers, sometimes only one cheer, where many people just give it a boo. And um, as I, you know, we were taught um, by our mentors um, to do the straight and narrow as scientific objective anthropologists, never write in the first person and all of that. And so for some people, it, it, it comes hard to accept the notion that um, we have to deal with ourselves as subjects um, and not just as um, you know, um, um, some kind of machine that can record ethnographic material in some sterile, neutral, comprehensive way. So I really um, push hard for this um, element of ref reflexivity without denouncing the sciences. Well, then, you know, the question of why do all of this, um, uh, this, is this just, you know, navel gazing? Is this a, a vanity project? And I want to give a resounding no, because I think that with all the divisiveness, um, including the generational one within anthropology, that um, we just have to understand each other's experiences um, and be able to, um, to learn from each other or else we're not gonna make it into the future. We can't just address the current crises, whatever it is, the escalating crises in the moment as emergencies. Some of us has to have to be considering the possibility of a long-term future. And if those of us who 
have the long view aren't able in some way to share it and make it interesting, then, um, you know, it may not bode well for the society at large, but it, it, it probably means anthropology won't survive. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Okay, but good. I, I, I don't really have any specific prompts. I wonder, you know, what the rest of you. Okay, let me just uh, add one more thing bef because uh, as you were talking, I was remembering um, two other kinds and I, I wonder whether you could tell me whether you think it's a memoir or not. Uh, Billie Jean Isbell, maybe you're familiar with her, uh, did a lot of work in Peru uh, and she um, uh, did some work uh, in the Shining Path area of uh, mm -hmm of Peru and she wrote a book called uh, Finding Cholita and uh, this book is about her experience as an ethnographer during the before during and after the um, the, the uh, civil war in Peru and I wonder if that counts as a, as a memoir um, and, the, and something I'm reminded of as I was thinking about that is the Laura uh, Bohannon's book, um, Return to mm -hmm. Laughter, which is, you know, a kind of a classic mm -hmm. that I yeah. learned. And so uh, those... Or Jean Briggs with the Inuit. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so some are a... fictional and some are memoirs, but fictional mm -hmm. is okay. Yeah. Um, um, I'm an ex-Andeanist, um, uh, and so I know some of uh, Billy Jean's earlier work, but I don't know the one you're mentioning. But if she's talking about her own experiences, her own formative experiences, and how who she is, you know, and who she became um, affected the way she interacted and how that um, shaped the anthropology that she produced, then mm -hmm. I think that would count as a memoir. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't have to be a pure memoir. I mean, I think that, as I said, it's sometimes fuzzy between uh, a first person subjective ethnography and um, and what actually is a memoir. Yeah, I just mentioned one up and this is my last thing I'm talking because I'm just fascinated with this topic, Jim, but there's uh, a, t uh, a book by George Gemelch who was a professional baseball player mm -hmm. uh, before he became an anthropologist and he is, uh, written a book i think it's called play ball but i don't remember exactly the title of it uh but that is a memoir of his ex time uh but now as an anthropologist but he went back and started writing about um minor league ball players but based on his memory of what it was like to be in the minors when he was uh, younger so that's surely anybody... an example yeah but um i do refer to um um, a book that, that George and Sharon wrote together about mm -hmm. uh, all of their field work experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, oh, the and he mentions oh. it, that, you know, his, his career as a minor league baseball player. So that's, that's one chapter in a larger book, but I, I'm not familiar with the, the freestanding book. That mm -hmm. certainly would count. Okay. Uh, so are there any uh, questions? So uh, Alice, go ahead. If you want to use the. Yeah. yeah I the, okay. The yeah, I, I'd i like to start because in the first place, I wrote and published sort of this kind of a memoir, and it came out just uh, less than two years ago. So I had this direct experience with publishing now, and the question, the very important question of whether you're doing a trade kind of book or an academic book. And I now have, with the same editor, because he asked me to do this, an academic version of main issues in my life. Strictly academic is publishing rejected papers with text. But the point is, this is a very direct contrast from one of the best editors in anthropology, at uh, the one at uh, University of Nebraska Press. So if you're doing a popular type book, uh, possibly a trade book, but you want to have a wide readership, what I was told right away, you must have a narrative arc. 
Now, this is a real contrast with a lot of what Jim has been feeling, uh, and we've gone back and forth on this for months and months and months. Um, a narrative arc, storytelling, and deciding what goes in, what doesn't go in, because how does it affect the narrative arc versus doing an ethnography. I didn't mean this thing to move. And again, oh, that's better. So number one, that's the choice, academic or trade, and that strongly affects your style and your choices of what goes in. Secondly, I'm extremely committed for a long time to the history of our discipline. And so I want to say that George Spindler should not be overlooked. George Spindler in the 1980s was pushing people, put in a chapter or a preface where you describe your personal experience uh, in uh, doing this ethnography. This came out of those, remember the case histories and cultural anthropology, Holt Reinhard Winston, and George was the advisor, uh, leader, um, and he had a quarrel with the uh, press editor who said, we do tribes, we don't do persons. And Spindler said, no, we do persons who go to these tribal societies. The day the editor resigned, I got a phone call from George and said, okay, let's go ahead with that ghost dance study that you did and put in a chapter about your personal experience, how you came to this. And I said, what? That will destroy me as a professional. And George said, do it. So you know George Spindler as his leadership and studying formal education as a means of transmitting and forming uh, cultures. So that's a historical point in the 80s and George is a modest person, but Spindler should not be overlooked. Okay, uh, I wanna emphasize that Expanding anthropology that Paul Doty, uh, the late lamented Godson, was uh, a very active partner with me in. And this is very different from what Jim is describing, but it was very important for the history of our discipline, asking the leaders in various innovations in our field to write themselves their own version of why, how their innovations came about. Uh, Walter Goldschmidt in studying those family farms versus agro-business back in the 30s. Uh, Dwight Heath, alcoholism, my God. Who in the olden days would ever study alcoholics as a culture, do the ethnography? Um, the Vicos Project, Paul himself was in that. Ralph, I think you were in that too, in some way. Um, at any rate, these are highly significant turning points in the development of our discipline. And that's quite different from what Jim is um, engaged in, and there's certainly room for everything, but so many of you here don't neglect uh, thinking of writing either a uh, essay, uh, a more academic paper, or a book, and you can do more than one book, uh, where you emphasize how an innovation that became important in the discipline came about and alice alice yeah, let's, and let's, give, let's give jim a I chance want to close, close up tim okay we do historical science it is completely different from nsf science which is all you ever hear about stem so anybody's interested um 
email me and I'll, I'll send you the chapter on what is historical science and this is what we do that is science. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. Uh, Jim, do you want to respond? And then Kathy, I'll come to you next. Well, not to object to anything, Alice. I, I'm always learning from you. We've been colleagues and friends for decades um, and I continue to learn. And here I am talking about my um, preliminary attempts to do fragments of memoir and, and you've been there and done that. So, you know, and you've talked about your early life and your formative experiences all the way through your uh, yeah. career uh, development, struggles and all of that. I don't think um, what I'm suggesting is something instead of or different. And in fact, the, the, the book that you and Paul edited, I went back and looked at it and more than half of them, um, they're talking about themselves and their formative yeah. experiences yeah. too. So I just yeah. want to bring this out more consciously and in some way that maybe um, it'll spark the interest and in, and in, in get the rest of us to do this together and kind of, you know, make it more, more coherent from comparing notes about it. And, and you're up on that list, you know, of, of the, of the memoirs in that early slide. Yeah. So. Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was wonderful. And I think we could all talk for years about many of the things you brought up. I partly got interested in Latin America from watching I Love Lucy and wanting desperately to know what Ricky was saying when he yelled <laughs> at Lucy. Um, but, but and then in, to follow Alice, uh, Florence Babb, I recently re or a couple of years ago reviewed her latest book on women's place in the Andes. And they included and she discussed papers that have been rejected and went back to revisit them, include those. Um, but I just wanted to point up perhaps another example, um, which is something that I did, which is to produce auto autobiographical work, which is dialogical and and kind of a conversation. So several yeah. years ago, I edited a book with Steve, the late Steve Rubenstein that was based on a AAA session I organized trying to understand why Americanist studies had been so siloed into North and South America. And I, I put together people who could discuss, oh, thank you, yes, that's it. <laughs> so, yes. So it's like, what happened to Paul Radin and Bandelier and, and Krober and, um, and and what do we so I put together people who had either worked on both sides of the border as I have or have engaged or some some element of it. And what Steve and I decided to do to kind of come to conclusions at the end of this edited work was to create a dialogue between our different experiences in anthropology. And it was um it, it started out sort of addressing his professor at Columbia, Robert Murphy's statement that nobody's interested in, what was it? Nobody's interested in what anthropologists do. They're only interested in um, the people anthropologists work with. Um, but what we did was we engaged with people like Don uh, Kulik's work on sex and erotic subjectivity, where he said that instead of uh, writing in a way that results in banal egoism, you can do, you can use autobiography, you can use self in an epistemologically productive way, and those are Kulik's work words. And so we were we our goal was in in looking at our different experiences, getting into anthropology. I was ten years Steve senior, and he unfortunately passed away shortly after we did this work. Um, my experiences at University of Illinois, his at Columbia, his with a strong Jewish background, mine Macedonian. And, and what we're trying to get at through our conversation is answers to some questions regarding how we might put the Americas back together through our different experiences working across borders. And uh, we saw it as a con contribution to a sociology of knowledge about Americanist studies. And so we ended up the the very, I'm, I'm looking at the page here, but I said one of the things we learned is that Native American studies programs in North America could benefit greatly by including much more integration of Latin American indigenous research, except for brief references to Weston Labar or Georges Devereux, uh, who wrote about messianic movements like the Ghost Dance by mm -hmm. Joanne Fort Solomon, Alice, and so forth. Um, 
we, that there's been precious little cross-continental com comparative work. The quincentenary brought forth several popular compendia of musings on the Americas, but it was rare to see any systematic comparisons that challenged existing theories or stereotypes. Work needs to be done that compares the views on everything from sovereignty to repatriation and, and so forth, so that North American Indians are not tempted to dismiss Latin Americans as corrupted by Catholicism, and Latin American indigenous people are not tempted to view those in the North as Indio, Indio gringos on the verge of extinction. And we came to this by talking to each other. So it's written as like KF, you know, I talked about some things, like being in Illinois, working with Frank Solomon and Norman Whitten, and then him jumping to what he did in Columbia and back and forth. And so I just want to submit that. And I hope to find it, that or other examples of that because it was a autobiographical, but it was dialogical and it was really productive for us in our work. Thanks. Jim, Jim? Nope. and then uh, Murray, I'll get to you next. Okay. I mean, Bill, Bill, I'll get you next. Jim, go ahead. Did you have no, something you wanted to say? No, I just say interesting. Yeah, let's dialogue too. Okay, uh, Bill Mitchell. I thanks, Jim. I was just curious about your use of the word enchantment. Uh, exactly, you know, it has so many connotations. Exactly why you use that word enchantment, right? And and how you use it. The question. That's a tough one. Um, as I said, I was. Um, you also use, by, excuse me, you also use disenchantment too. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I participate in, um, in insight meditation here. Um, that's, and it's called the Vipassana tradition. It's been adopted in this country, and there are people who do it all over the, the country. And they say that, you know, we have to be disenchanted. We can't do magical thinking. We have to um, try to uh, just clear away uh, our preconceptions and see the world as it really is. It, it's a very austere kind of thing. And, and I don't want to be um, completely disenchanted in that way. Max Weber, who talked about disenchantment, was that our lives were becoming more and more bureaucratized. It, it's the kind of world where where it's all positivism, and you know nothing is real that can't be counted and measured, and and nothing really counts unless it's for some purpose of control, and um, the enchantment is where you just experience the world. Um, there are marvels that we can't understand. We can try, you know, we can develop our rationality. We shouldn't become irrational, but always, you know, be open and and living with that sense of wonder. And that's, that's sustained me, that's a motivation. And so there are times when I've been down, you know, and um, I think I came to a, a, you know, a bad point at the end of college where I didn't know where I was going to go next. And I was quite disenchanted and going to Thailand and the Peace Corps and throwing myself into a village, barely able to speak the language and just trying to absorb what was going on, you know, that was that was magical in some way that I did not have to be in control, just to, um, have the things that I knew already that made sense, didn't make sense here. That kind of opening up to a sense of wonder and looking at the colors, the smells, you know, walk going back to Thailand after 40 some years to visit my son who was living there and walking along the streets of Bangkok and, and going from one of these food stands to the next with the aromas, each each one with this food stand or her food stand with their own formula and own spices and, and the smells shift as you go from one to the other. And then you cross a bridge over a canal and it stinks to high heaven. And then you cross it and then you start to get the good smells again. And that kind of um, um, enjoyment, sometimes you're appalled, that sensory experience that Paul Stoller talks about, that's all, you know, allowing, you know, the the world to still be enchanted and not have to understand it and control it, but just experience it with a sense of wonder. Um, I don't know, is that something the rest of you feel in, in the world and, and take as a value, you know, that makes it worthwhile to live? Sure. 
Uh, Certainly Ron, sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. Ron, Ronald Schwartz, do you have? Yeah. Um, I, I was also in the, in the Peace Corps, which led me into anthropology, and I was very lucky in my my second partner had uh, finished a master's degree in anthropology at Chicago. His name was Albert Hofting, in case he's, any of you might know him. Um, and then I went, <clears throat> but I went into anthropology in order to do development. I really didn't, go, even though I did an ethnography for my dissertation. And since then, I spent um, about 35 years in training anthropologists or uh, and doing development work in about well, 30 some odd years in Africa and 10 years in Latin America. And I guess I come to a, one conclusion that I kind of like to share, be working you know, with, with uh, indigenous people and, and tribal people in these places. And what, what really strikes me is, number one, how tribal we all are. Even those who are in, you know, urban, industrial types of settings, and how the features of personal life and behavior and character that I would see in African communities, and well as with the community, because I spent many, many years in the community where I had been a Peace Corps volunteer, um, and and where we did development work. Um, and and with, with the the question of the, the the types of personalities, the people being honest, those people working for the best interest of the community, those people that would lie in a second or only interested in money, they're everywhere. And it reflects on me. I mean, I'm because I am writing out a memoir and and a book on on the uh, what happened to me and the group uh, that I was a member of is um is, is the issue of the tribal mentality as being very critical of no matter where you really go. Even, I mean, I see this in the diplomatic corps that I work with, because I work with UNICEF and the World Bank, you know, and USAID. <laughs> and 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 this this kind of distribution of personalities and character. And it is to me very, very much trying to promote in that group that you're in. Uh, your own interest or the interest of your group for your own promotion. I can't believe the number of people that would be telling me, people that work in the World Bank or people in USAID, telling me to do things which normally we would say are completely unethical, you know, or against, uh, you know, the interest of our country. And it, 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 it was, I, I think this is the biggest conclusion I've really led to now. And that, that probably in terms of where we are in terms of the current situation, uh, that it's those kinds of educational and other experiences that begin to break down the issue of tribal mentality to one of a globalized one as being one of the most critical issues that um, anthropologists and other people need to deal with if we're to move on to another stage, because uh, I guess the argument here, what the next stage be, and most people seem to agree, is World War Four would be one of sticks and stones. Uh, and uh, I think there's a way out of that. Okay, Jim, do you want to, uh, and then Kathy, I'll come back to you. Jim, do you want to say anything? Only a quickie that we had a little email exchange before this, and mm -hmm. you mentioned Los Angeles. Did you grow up there too? <laughs> I was born in Los Angeles, and when you arrived, I left to Brooklyn, <laughs> New York. Uh, yeah, I, I I grew up. I went to this may be of some interest. I went to pri to grade school with Bernie Sanders, Ruth Bader Ginsburg wasn't Ginsburg then Ruth Bader, um, and later Chuck Schumer went to the same place. And you could talk about, I and mean, when you think of a cultural influence and how much my brain, and I listen to them and I say, you know, this is exactly where my head is. And you begin to, it seems to me, another example of the tribalism, the culture that we grew up in that neighborhood with our families. And um, 
and and, and I really and accept that's who I am is very much what came out in those early years with our families and you know grandparents and parents being immigrants from from Eastern Europe. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Kathy, and then I'll go to Dennis after Kathy. <clears throat> You don't mean me, do you? Do you mean me? My hand's yes, not. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, I just didn't put my hand down. You can barely see it. That was from before. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, okay, Dennis. All right, well, Jim, uh, very fine way you put all of this together and uh, with the structure and questions. And uh, I did attend the uh, workshop you had at the uh, AAA meetings. I came in a little late, but I experienced that. Um, so I want to add an aspect that you didn't quite get to, and, and that is the emotions involved. Uh, as we reflect back on our past during this memoir writing, um, I can see that it, uh, if we write the memoir and, uh, and it gets published, uh, that's, that's one aspect. But if we present it in live in front of an audience, uh, there's, uh, there's a, an emotion that comes out that uh, you haven't quite reflected on, and it might be worth dwelling on a little bit. And so, you know, as an applied anthropologist over my career, I would actually be writing about aspects that I was involved in and projects. And so many of my publications are on the processes of culture change instituted by an applied anthropologist. And so there's little career snippets, you know, as I went along. And so in a sense, those are um, a memoir pieces. Uh, but part of this uh, emotional part is that the last AAA meetings, I wrote about the career of Hazel Weidman, who uh, was the founder of the Society for Medical Anthropology. And so I was very, uh, not a, she's not, we're not kin related, but I was very close to her at the University of Miami Department of Psychiatry in the 1980s. Um, and she, uh, you know, basically founded the, the field in many different ways. And so I was hired as one on her, uh, in her office of transcultural education and research. And so now I'm in the role of uh, forming a, a special interest group for this Society for Medical Anthropology on uh, uh, health professions education. And so I, at, the, at the AAA meetings, I was talking about her career and what she wanted to do for medical anthropology. And then here I was implementing that some of those aspects by starting this interest group within the SMA. So she's the founder of the SMA and I'm, I'm adding to it. But during that presentation, which was very well attended, uh, I found myself in an emotional state because I was reflecting back on, you know, very significant others and, and portions in my life. And so, uh, there's a, an emotional part of doing this kind of work that you're suggesting, and especially when we're standing in public, you know, when you're, when, as I said, when we're writing it, it can be kind of a, out there in the world. But when you're, like you did a lot of the personal reflections right today. Uh, and so I, I'm just uh, saying that there's a, uh, a big emotional aspect of this that you, you haven't quite captured in your list of things. Um, I, I maybe haven't made it explicit, but I, I think it was implicit in a lot of what I was saying. <clears throat> it's the emotions um, that, that motivate us. Um, they're the joys and the sorrows and the angers and the fascinations that, that get us going. And they're what make us, make us human and make us different. And I think we interact with each other um, on an emotional level level if we didn't have those emotions we wouldn't be interested in each other and we wouldn't have we would just be there and i think that's one of the big things that make us human that um we cannot imagine that ai is going to um include um but it's, it has everything to do with um what influence shaped us in becoming anthropologists and what twists and turns we made um or our emotional responses to things so yeah. I'm glad you made it explicit, but I hope it was yeah. implicit now that, you know, you bring it up. Yeah. Well, the, one of the points is that I, I've made many presentations in the AAA meetings and others, 
but I was reporting on the others or things that I was doing that, but it wasn't talking about me as a person. And so this time it was me as a person. And so it, it caused me to be uh, fumbling almost in, in emotions during the presentation. And I was just bringing that up as a, a public emotional. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ralph and then Suzanne. Yeah, I, I appreciate the discussion. I um, I have just a couple less philosophical um, points that I'd like to make. There's a a, a new uh, memoir published by Stefano Varesi, which is actually an excellent um, account of uh, his life as someone who worked um, in the Amazon. Um, so I recommend that. I'd also like to say that I, I think um, I found, uh, well, first of all, I find writing memoirs a little bit really intimidating, especially when I read good ones. <laughs> and um, the ones that some of that I found especially helpful are those written not by anthropologists, but by psychoanalysts, uh, because they are the ones who are, who are specialists in probing our thought processes and uh, and individual histories and so forth. So I, I recommend things like Oliver Sacks' uh, um, memoir uh, entitled "On the Move," um, which which is really really superb. There are certain dangers in writing one's memoirs. Uh, Joseph Carrier, an anthropologist who specialized in Mexico. Uh, wrote an autobiography, essentially, um, more of that than a memoir. And after um, he gave some copies to friends and afterwards, some of them never talked to him again, because all of us know something about uh, many of the, the life aspects of the life of our friends and colleagues, but we don't know everything. Uh, and, and then we find out some very surprising things sometimes. Um, I am in the process of working on on my own memoirs, um, and I make some progress occasionally. But I have published uh, a number of accounts um, about about my work and um, my life in the Andes. Uh, but those publications are all in Spanish and published in Peru. And I have also uh, published about. Uh, human sexuality, including uh, aspects of my own, uh, which are fairly, um, yeah, personal and no longer private. Uh, but um, I, I continue to work on this, and I don't know how far I'll get. Thank you. Thanks, let Ralph, me, very much. Uh, Tim, let me say that publishers are very alert to possible libel and defamation uh, suits. And that is why I was told, don't put any names in the trade version. And um, the academic version, be damn careful. Your editor will be on you on this. Sorry. Okay. Suzanne? Yes, thank you very much, Jim. I really appreciated your talk. I also knew Glenn Peterson. I knew Esther Newton. Margaret Mead, all of them. It was really uh, fascinating to hear your. I didn't know that they had that um, Glenn and Esther had written memoirs. Um, really, thank you for all of this. One thing that that is impressive impresses me is that how much how uh, building on what Dennis said is how personal our research is. You know, I was. 23, 24 years old, working in India on my dissertation research. And now, 60 years later, I'm I'm still in contact with these people. Now, I have worked mm -hmm. as an applied anthropologist a lot of this time. I haven't, I haven't, right now I'm doing a little mop-up job writing up some of the old, you know, some of the work I never quite finished about the ethnography, but it's it's amazing how personal these things are. When I I uh, the granddaughter of my assistant, who was seventeen, now she's in her seventies. Uh, the granddaughter of my assistant knows English and found me on the internet, 
and put us in contact. And she told me that <laughs> her grandmother had a dream about me. That you know, we all you you can't do this research without getting very personally connected yeah. to the people you work with, can you? And that doesn't go away just because your job your job description changes. Anyway, on the question of publishing, I'm I'm interested in writing mem a memoir someday, but I've kind of given up on commercial publishing. I've been doing a lot of self publishing for the last few years, and you know it's not uh, profitable at all. But at least it's out there. Okay. Okay, thank you. I would remark on, on your tone of surprise that it's all personal. And I think it's because in our training in a previous era, we were supposed to suppress all of that and just be objective, generic, scientific anthropologists when it was our very personhood which, which made us um, ethnographers, if that's what we did. Or if we're doing development projects and meeting the people to find out what they need and what they want, it's all personal. And you can't you can't avoid it, you know. But if you do, then it leads to some strange things. So um, that that's a point really to bring out. Working in development, I've often tried to go back to places where I formerly visited just to see how it was going. In fact, I'm feeling kind of frustrated now because I want to go back to Bangladesh and check on a couple of things. And I don't have any funding for this, or but I really want to know about certain things, how how it went, you know, people I met, because a lot of the projects that you work for, when they're over, they're over and, and nobody follows up and nobody knows whatever came of it. They've, you know, met their deadlines, they've paid their money and they move right on, right? So this is very frustrating to me as a person <laughs> who has a lot of curiosity about these actual people. I'm, I'm not surprised, but it's a very big contrast with economists and even some sociologists, isn't it? Is the personal mm -hmm. engagement that we have to have really in order to do this work. Mm -hmm. um, Murray, Murray Leaf. I wasn't going to, but I have to disagree with Jim on being told to keep yourself out of it, that that's being objective. I, I don't know if I was told that. If I was, I ignored it. I think being objective is putting yourself in the situation and being clear about what you do and what you perceived and how that results in the description you're providing. That's really a different epistemology. I don't talk about ideal types either. I talk about what people said and how I verified whatever I'm claiming about it. Well, that wasn't brought out in my training. <laughs> I think we had... We did not have entirely different training. David Schneider was my uh, dissertation advisor, but I was an undergraduate in philosophy and just had, a, I think, a different background. I think growing up in Tucson, uh, just you, <laughs> there are just too many groups around and too many flows of this kind of identity and that kind of identity. You have to take it as pretty fluid and pretty uh, variable and not something that you you I, you don't put yourself in one hole and put everyone else in each one one hole for each person we keep changing and that's part of the description uh jim i i, I want whoops uh let's see i i don't know who that is um Jim, I, I I wonder if uh, you you might address the issue that you know, like George Marcus and folks like that brought up with regard to, you know, writing ethnography is what they were doing, you know, what they were suggesting uh, during the postmodernist turn was that is that something that we're, you know, that we should have been doing all along? Uh, to what extent is, you know, our should we have been doing memoir writing at every stage of our of our ethnographic career? And are we getting coming back to it too late? I don't have a very good answer for that, I'm afraid. But um, I did welcome whatever's 
under that rubric of um, reflexivity because I didn't think of that from my earlier training that that we are particular individuals and that affects um, what we're going to study in the first place, what we're going to want to do. And um, some of us haven't reflected enough on that or didn't reflect enough on that while we were doing uh, our earlier research and our earlier projects. And, and now is an opportunity to explore that. Um, but that um, uh, I think that we also can use that. This is not an answer, but this is a, a, another final comment that I don't know if that got lost, but by going back and describing um, uh, the settings, the times uh, of our growing up and coming of age and doing a kind of an ethnography of the past in those places, we can, we can, uh, we can enrich the record of what's known, including uh, of our own cultures, rather than uh, for those of us who've gone all over the world um, to add to the um, corpus of ethnography by a kind of an auto ethno history that we're trained to go back and think of what it was like when we were growing up. We also can back go back to earlier field work and and use um, this this combination of historicism and presentism of um, uh, what it was like, you know, from 1945 to 1960 in Los Angeles. What were what did people know then you know, that that we know now that they didn't know then, and how were they looking at the world? And and that applies to our earlier field work, too. Um, but then we can add the present perspective on it and see what was missing or what they were doing and knew that we've forgotten. All those kinds of things I think are valuable uh, as as um, as doing more kinds of ethnography too. We don't have to consider it just personal exercises. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that really didn't come up so much before um, that postmodern turn. And mm -hmm. then uh, a lot of it I just didn't go along with because it was so anti-science. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Anybody? Uh, uh, Murray, did you want to come back to that? Yes. Murray? Yeah, you... I'm trying to think of the answer. Uh, I think it's a question. Uh, again, Jim has emphasized what he was taught. I think you have to be sort of dense about what you're being taught and think for yourself and play what you're being taught against what you're actually experiencing. And, and Jim's talking about talking about your experience. Yes, absolutely. And all sorts of ways. I went to the field um, with coca cultivators in Bolivia with tremendous research protocols of doing time allocation and uh, and uh, labor exchange records and all of that kind of data collection after doing some census. And then I met these people as individuals and got to know them as individuals. And, and then some of my best writing was not writing up that kind of data, but writing up the kinds of things that happened, you know. And I just turned into sort of a, a, a both and rather than an either or, or flip from one to the other. And uh, Why? I think the postmodern turn called for us to flip away from the, um, the social science and behavioral science approaches. Uh, before I get to um, uh, Rick and uh, back to Suzanne, let me just mention that Diva has some interesting things in the uh, in the chat about uh, her own uh, working with uh, autoethnography, a book that she's working, an autoethnographical book in which she's writing about her experience as both an anthropologist and her issues having to do with uh, disabilities and people with disabilities and um, and will intentionally have chapters of autoethnography and her audiences, not just anthropologists, but linguists, disability studies and and so on. Right, Diva? Okay. Uh, yes, um, uh, Rick. Yes, um, I was just going to follow up a little bit on uh, Murray's comments. I think that uh, Jim is right that once upon a time there was an ethos in anthropology, social cultural anthropology that uh, 
we are trying to be scientific and we want to be objective. Uh, like Murray, I studied for a while with David Schneider at the University of Chicago. And um, I think that Schneider was uh, somewhat tr uh, transitional in all of this. Um, Schneider, I think, regarded himself as being objective, but he was trying to do an objective study of the symbols that uh, people carried in their minds and shared with one another. And um, that epistemologically, that was the turning point for him that, uh, that um, what we need to focus on is not who does what, where, and when, but the symbols in terms of which people are thinking about and communicating about all of this. And I think that that was a uh, major uh, impetus for the uh, work of uh, people like George Marcus and the, uh, uh, the start of postmodernism. So um, putting Murray's comments and Jim's comments together, I think um, is presents a uh, pretty accurate uh, view of the way that uh, um, that um, epistemological positions developed within anthropology. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Suzanne. Yeah, I, Jim. Who did you study with at Columbia? Well, I went to be in Pete's. Vita's uh, ecological anthropology program, which was human ecology, which was dehumanizing. It was looking at humans as part of, you know, the biological world and other species, populations rather right. than cultures. And that was a very healthy thing up to a point, but it didn't matter because they didn't have any money anymore. And then it got canceled the next year. So I had Alan Johnson who, um, who worked in Latin America and peasant communities. And and he was for collecting good data, and he said you don't have to do razzle dazzle statistics, but you know do all the counting and all the measuring that you can as a backdrop for what you study. And then I you know um, was, found my way into Marvin Harris's um, um, theory class, and um, we went through rise of anthropological theory, which was my second semester there, and I didn't have that much of an anthropological background. And, uh, you know, that kind of um, blew my mind. Um, yeah. But he, he was not helpful either when I approached him. And eventually it was Bob Murphy who got it. Oh, and then there was Alex Aland. I wanted to be in the ecological anthropology program and do medical anthropology with Alex Aland. And so the very first semester I went into his advanced seminar and he announced the first day that he wasn't interested in medical anthropology anymore. I stayed with him because of his studies of the implications of Darwinian uh, uh, evolution for cultural evolution. But by the time I was working on the adaptation of the Andean um, exchange and cooperative labor traditions when they moved from the Andes down into the Amazon lowlands, and uh, he wouldn't talk to me about that. And he said he wasn't interested in cultural adaptation anymore either. So I kind of was left um, adrift. But it was Bob Murphy who anybody who walked into his office, he said, oh, who are you? What are you interested in? Engaged in a conversation. And he had been, you know, a, a South Americanist too and knew the lowlands of South America. So we had something to talk about. But he also was my link back to Julian Stewart um, because he, he, you know, he worked with Julian Stewart very closely. And um, I wanted to do more than cultural ecology, but... Um, it was um, Bob Murphy. Now that was predominantly a male department, but Shirley Gornstein, who didn't get tenure there in archeology, span she allowed me to do an archeology span um, independent study. And um, Betty Denich, who didn't get tenure there, did um, uh, culture change and modernization from a, a quite radical perspective. And I remember being in class with Ida Sussler. It, it was a, a challenging class too. So I kind of made my way through. I want to say something about this. Uh, this. Oh, and you're a friend of Cherry Lowman, right? Oh, yes. So, yeah. so we were we were very very close friends, but not necessarily yeah. that we studied together. Yeah. After yeah, Pete Vida was gone, after they were divorced, 
we were friends, uh, Cherry and her daughter, Andy, to this day. Anyway, I, I was more with Abe Rossman and um, Ann Murphy and Aaronsburg. So, but about this, somebody told me to write in my field notes what my personal feelings were. I don't remember any specific instructions about this, but I've been looking back at my field notes now for the last few years, and they're full of all sorts of personal, you know, ob observations. And I feel terrible today, and I hate the food here, and uh, documenting my culture shock experiences. None of it shows up in the the formal writing, but somehow I was I was trained to document that that uh, kind of personal experience. And about the question of postmodernism, I, I agree that it's a good idea to um, make to be clear about what your point of view is and where you where you're coming from and how that influences you. And um, I, but you can take it too far to the point where sometimes at the meetings you hear people saying objectivity is impossible. You can't study other cultures. You can only study your own. Blah blah blah. I think that's ridiculous. Anyway, the whole the whole thing is, and I've now lost my track of train of thought. But this is um, the objectivity is necessary to. Oh yes, this is the other thought. I had a job for a few months with UNICEF, introducing qualitative methods into their program monitoring system. They have very good statistics, but they couldn't figure out how and why things weren't working in certain places. And I, it was a wonderful assignment. It was absolutely fascinating. And this is what we're really good at. I did need to go to the sociology literature and talk to them about focus groups and other structured ways of getting qualitative information in a hurry that you can't, you don't have to go move in with somebody for a year, but there are lots of good ways of doing rapid, you know, rapid assessments with quality. But the, the, the key is qualitative here, that that's what we're especially good at, I think, you know, and so it, there's, there's room for this. It's, it's not objective. It doesn't have to be objective. It's not supposed to be objective. It's a personal connection and the insights you gain from that, isn't it? Yeah. And you talked uh, about, you know, putting down your feelings about things and that was Melanowski's diary. And it was not something for him to publish along with his ethnography. And no. when it came out later, there were a lot of people who were very upset about it. But so some of the things might be best kept private or at least as long as you're still active in the field. Um, I won't name names, uh, you know, Alice said you can get sued, but maybe these people aren't alive anymore. But, um, you know, I was told that you should never publish in those other countries where you do research because it's not going to get you ahead in your career. And from very early on, I wanted to have collegial relations in, in, in Bolivia and it didn't work. But then in Co Costa Rica, it really brought that to the forefront. So publishing in those other countries was very a personal kind of thing, and it gives you the perspective of the local tradition in anthropology. And then I was told, and I won't name the name either, that we should, I mentioned this before, we should never write in the first person, and, and that was very restrictive. So we were liberated from those kinds of things. Uh, we're, we're really almost out of time, but Diva, uh, and then Murray, and then that will be the end, okay? So, Diva? Yeah. Um, although ethnography is still ethnography. So what is your data? So I use letters, diaries, photographs, you name it. I do archival research in my house as well as in all the groups I go to. So I have the same data about myself as I have about other people. So it's, it's still ethnography. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, <clears throat> absolutely. And Bill, you had a, your hand up. I'm sorry, I said Murray, but yeah. I'm not Bill. Uh, j just briefly, uh, Malinowski in his famous introduction to Argonauts, uh, part of his methodology was to talk about your personal stuff. I forget what rubric he used to, to discuss that. But I also wanted to mention, and they, there's a, you know, a, a lot of what we do depends upon our goal of something. Uh, uh, Jim is talking about a memoir where uh, certainly uh, we are uh, the major focus of, a, of any memoir, right? Uh, whereas in, in terms of in the field, uh, our, our personal stuff is only relevant insofar it has any impact. Uh, on the material that we're collecting, right? You know, the, the goal uh, uh, is, is very different from a memoir. So there's, there's this yeah, tension between, between the two. I don't think we can uh, speak of uh, we should do this or we shouldn't do that. It really depends on what we're doing. Uh, and in many ways, our, you know, our social position does have an impact on the kinds of data we collect. And then it's relevant. Uh, to uh, that data data collection. Okay. That's all. Mm -hmm. And Bill, we worked together on that session on omissions and silences, yes, where yeah. we tried to um, become more aware of what we had missed because of what we took with us into the field. And then there were also the things that we decided we, we shouldn't say, yeah. you know. But those are the kinds of things that we can deal with in more personal writings. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, Jim. That's great. There, there is a, uh, a a book I read some time ago that had about you know sex in the field. I forget the exact exact title of it. And you know, there's <laughs> there are uh, you know uh, you know there is that kind of stuff going on that most people feel very uncomfortable about. Um, you know, and uh, then you know, so there are some things that are personal decisions about what you feel comfortable and talking about. And then there are other things that you just don't even realize that are there that are very important to talk about, but it's part of that, you know, the blinders that we have coming from our cultural uh, perspectives. And, uh, you know, I'm reminded of the, of um, Dan Everett that studied the Pidaha people in, in Brazil, uh, who, you know, went to the field as a linguist expecting that there would be relatively broad, similar characteristics of categories and of speech, but found that there was very, very little in common with them because of the language was so very, very different. And so they were really looking you know, like two ships passing in the night. But um, uh, I don't wanna have the last word, Jim, if you wanna say something before we sign off. As a last word, I would say it, it's it, it's not a matter of you know uh, ego self aggrandizement. Um, I don't think <laughs> any of us appreciate that, but it's what we can um, use for um, ethnographic insight, and that's what I'm really driving for. The kinds of things we can describe, but also so that we can understand ourselves, what we looked for and what we found because of who we were. And, and discuss that with other people, uh, what they look for and what they found because of who they were. And it allows us to put together different points of view and realize you know, that the whole picture is much more complicated and, and we really have to um, go together or we drift farther apart, we become more polarized. So that, that's the reason for it, not self-aggrandizement, but for bringing us together and maybe sharing some vis wisdom for the future. If there is a future. Are you, are you going to be doing something on this at the Tampa meetings? Um, I don't know. Mm, what I'm doing at the Tampa meetings is publishing in Costa Rica where it didn't work in collaboration in Bolivia of, mm -hmm. of making a, a point to publish there in Spanish, but how it was um, very successful and it, it made the anthropology much better to collaborate with Costa Rican anthropologists and publish there. You know, when you were talking about your, um, at the beginning of your slides, you were talking about uh, the things you're talking about today as an ASA project, and perhaps we should try and get together in Tampa to talk about 
this whole idea as a as an ASA project. And so mm -hmm. perhaps you can we can figure out a way to do that when we get there. Okay. And I have one more thing. I'm wearing my um, Society for the Anthropology of Work T-shirt, um, and um, I I kind of after we we speak with yeah 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 I S A W. So I try to get colleagues to do things. I don't know if that's good or bad, but at that time I was trying to get of the people in the Society for the Anthropology of Work to pay more attention to the work of anthropology. And I think this is um, a late in the game extension of that, of, of working on the work of anthropology. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks well, to all of you for your patience and your let's, contributions. Uh, let's talk about this in Tampa again. Thank you very much, Jim, very much. And thank you very much everybody for being here today. <laughs> Thank you, Diva and Alice, for your important in insights and uh, and for all of you, for all of your insights. It's great seeing you. And hi, Moshe, how are you doing? Uh, good to see you um, and see everybody else here. And so we'll see you back here in uh, on April 8, uh, 18th when Sid Greenfield will be talking about uh, rethinking his conclusions and his fieldwork among shamans in Brazil. So until then, thank you very much for being here and we'll see you next time. I will get the video of this uh, out to you as soon as possible, okay? Bye-bye. Thanks thank again. You. Bye, everybody. Thank you again, thank Jim, you. very much. Appreciate it very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>